Okay, this video is a book review. Um, the name of the book is called Genius, The Natural History of Creativity by Heinz Eysenck um, from copyright 1995. So this guy, Heinz Eysenck, was a very famous psychologist, very opinionated, controversial, cantankerous, all that kind of stuff. Um, and also, I think it's good that people study, you know, uh, how geniuses develop. Um, cause when there's an atmosphere of trying to promote that, you get more of them. And there's been great episodes in history, like ancient Athens, you know, around 400 BC and also Renaissance Italy around 1500 AD. And when well, they just produced tons more geniuses, a much, much higher frequency. And that's because they had a society that promotes it. It couldn't be genetic to happen that suddenly to come and go so quickly. So it would be good. Like, for example, I think all the public schools should be teaching the children study skills. Every single kid in school learns how to play baseball, football, basketball, and other sports, kickball, and all this stuff. But nobody learns study skills. That's idiotic. I actually think the public schools are designed to make children stupid. Um, all these kids go to college, pay these high tuitions. They don't have any study skills. They think they have study skills. Just because you can get an A where there's no competition doesn't mean you have study skills. Study skills means you can get good grades in a competitive environment, okay? Um, so anyways, what's a prodigy? A prodigy is somebody who learns fast. And basically grade school, uh, high school and college, and even most grad school is just memorization. Somebody who's good at it can learn the material more quickly, but they still haven't done anything original. They haven't done anything interesting or creative. And I can tell you lots of doctors have high IQs, but to find a doctor who's actually creative and original, that is very rare, okay? so. Prodigy and genius are two different things. The, the definition of genius we'll use for this talk is a genius is someone who transforms their field. That's by Dean Simonton. He's written a quite a bit on the development of genius. So it's somebody who not only is an expert in the field, but who's able to go beyond what is known and create something new. Okay, um, there was a guy, I think his name was Anders was his last name. I forget his first name. And he wrote about to become an expert takes 10,000 hours of deliberate practice, means practice committed to improvement. And that sounds nice, but remember what he's saying is just to be an expert takes 10,000 hours. To be a genius, to transform the field, that's going to take far more than 10,000 hours. Okay, what was that 10,000 hours? I forget the exact amount. It was something like four hours of study a day for 10 years. Something like that. I forget. It doesn't really matter. The point is to be an expert is a long way away from being a genius in the field. Um, okay, so what else? Uh, here's just some examples of genius, Aristotle, Cicero, Michelangelo, etc. Um some things about geniuses to help nurture intellectual development in, in a child and anybody. They're often homeschooled. They often had a period of prolonged loneliness in their childhoods where they did a ton of reading. They learned how to entertain themselves. Um, they learned how to think independently. Often from having had this lonely experience or for other reasons in their childhood, they're mildly asocial. They're okay with being alone because a lot of kids, all they care about is hanging around with their friends. And I think cell phones lower IQs 20 or 30 points because they all hang around with kids the same age. They're all equally ignorant and they don't learn anything from each other. And then their focus becomes on being more popular in the clique rather than developing their minds. When a kid hangs around with older people, they tend to develop their minds with their parents or teachers, etc. Okay, things that also increase the intellectual development, uh, breastfeeding, um, developing a love of reading. So that's why it's really a good thing if one of the parents models reading. My father always read, so that got me to read. I wanted to be like my dad. That was a good thing. Um, people also, the, the famous thing people say, well, if you don't send your kid to school, they won't develop social skills. And I'm going to tell you something, a retard, a moron could develop social skills. It's easy to develop social skills. Don't worry about that. That's easy to train. And a lot of the social skills they develop in the in the public schools and the high schools are bad. Okay, they learn how to drink alcohol. They learn how to smoke cigarettes. They learn how to be promiscuous. I mean, all kinds of stuff you don't want them to learn. Um, so it's, it's, it's social skill development in, in a public school is very, very overrated. Okay. Um, my advice about the modern public schools is run for your life in the opposite direction as fast as you can. Okay, um, if I could live my life over again, know what I know now, man, I would want to be homeschooled. I could really learn useful things, be sucking up languages, learning how to draw, all kinds of good stuff, learning how to play piano. Okay, what else? Uh, what are things that lower IQ? You know, 
uh, breastfeeding is much better. Eating these formulas can be really bad. You know, some soy formula in an aluminum can processed with egg saying, okay, alcohol drinking on the part of the mother or the child, uh, MJ, tobacco, all this stuff. These all lower IQ. So you want to avoid that. Um, and the kids should know to avoid that. It'll lower their brain power. And also the child has to have conf um, courage because a big part of being able to think is having the courage to be a nonconformist to ignore people who criticize you. Because there's always going to be stupid, rule-bound people that criticize you. I think it was Einstein who said, great minds always uh, encounter intense opposition from mediocre minds. And that is a true statement, okay? It was a guy, um, I think it was Jonathan Swift who said, you know, all geniuses encounter um, uh, a, a confederacy of dunces that try to, you know, damage their work, okay? Uh, courage being nonforming to nonconformist to ignore critics, introverted, um, independent, a loner, those are characteristic things of geniuses. They stick with the problem on their own. They're self-motivated for a prolonged amount of time. They're willing to think differently. They have this persistence, a desire to figure something out. They're willing to persevere despite no uh, reward for doing so other than their own self-satisfaction in solving a problem. They often have a bit of a fighter personality in them that they don't care if people call them stupid or weird or other names because they want to answer their question. So they have a relatively forceful character, almost dominant in their area of interest. Um, and they will pursue that goal even if they don't make any money for doing it because they want to know. It's not for getting a grade. It's not some external reward. It's an internal desire to answer a question that they feel is important, important to them. And they're willing to be an outsider because quite often breakthroughs come from outsiders. They're not trapped in the status quo conformity because like most scientists really are not very creative or even that smart. They just answer the micro questions in their field. They're not looking at the big picture or trying to do anything new. That's the safe thing to do is answer the micro question, do whatever the person paying you wants. Okay, uh, geniuses tend to have very strong confidence in their own ability. And they kind of have to have that so that when they're inevitably criticized and mocked and knocked down, so to speak, and set back, they sort of push their way back up to achieve and to pursue their topic, okay? Beethoven had said, an artist is someone who has learned to trust themselves. Okay, the genius must be very curious. This is anybody who wants to be great at something, really, and to do something new and innovative. They must be curious, inquisitive, inquisitive have an intense desire to learn. Um, and um, this can be Alfred Adler's inferiority principle, okay, and super motivation. Uh, so the inferiority principle means that they failed and had a setback in one area, so they then put all their energy into becoming successful in another area. That's Alfred Adler's inferiority principle. Alfred Adler was sort of a protege of Freud who went off on his own. Um, uh, one thing I'll remember, too, they're willing to be real stoic. I'll give you an example of a guy. Um, John Smith was a great wrestler out of Oklahoma, at Oklahoma State, and he won like a bunch of world championships. But one of the things that he did was he was willing to just live in some tiny, really cheap apartment because he said being in a real sparse environment helped him to focus on becoming a better wrestler, okay? You know, Dave Schultz focused on his technique for years. Mark Schultz, same thing with his intensity for years, you know, just when he was low man on a totem pole in his new environments, like when he first went over to Oklahoma, you have to be willing to go through these painful, embarrassing, humiliating phases. Okay, uh, Goethe, in order for a man to learn a complex field, he must love it. Yeah, because you're going to have to go through. Initially, there's an exciting phase of rapid learning, and you dream, and you fantasize about all the great things that are going to come out of it. Then you hit the long plateau of tedium, and you have to crank through all that before you become an expert, and you can start being creative. It takes a while to get there. They must have a desire to do something great or to excel, not just to get good grades and make money. I know tons and tons of doctors who wanted to get good grades, become a doctor, and have a career as a doctor. But they had no more ambition than that. None. Zero. Um, it's funny. I know I know a, a lady doctor who was very smart, uh, graduated like at the top of her class, and said to me, I don't care about medicine. I just want to make money. <laughs> said a lot of other funny things, too. Um... So if a person just is doing it for the financial reward, they have no interest whatsoever in doing anything creative, ever going beyond the standard, okay? Somebody who wants to go beyond the standard, they have an intense desire to make things better or to excel, to achieve something, to create something like a work of art. 
Um, they must be super industrious. They're going to have to do a ton of work, far more than it takes just to become an expert, to become you know a world leader and create something new and persevere through obstacles. They have to have incredible stamina. Uh, like Ian Fleming, the author of the James Bond books and you know the movies, uh, he said that they have to be monomaniacs, total workaholics, and that is true. Uh, Thomas Edison said, genius is 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. Um, and then what's funny is he had a guy working for him by the name of Nikolai Tesla, who was actually smarter than Edison. And Tesla, you know, Edison kind of screwed him over, so Tesla was pissed off and resentful. But Tesla had funny things to say about Edison. He said, Edison, if he had to find a needle in a haystack, he would not stop to reason where it was most likely to be. But he would proceed at once with a feverish diligence of a bee to examine straw after straw until he found the object of his search. Just a little theory and calculation would have saved him 90% of his labor. <laughs> uh, so yeah, he didn't think Edison was that smart. Nikolai Tesla continues, Antisocial behavior is a trait of intelligence in a world full of conformists. The mind is sharper and keener in seclusion and uninterrupted solitude. Originality thrives in seclusion, free of outside influences, beating upon us to cripple the creative mind. Be alone. Yes, be alone. That is the secret of invention. Be alone. That is where ideas are born. And Tesla continues, all that was great in the past was ridiculed, condemned, suppressed. Okay, that was all quotes from Nikola Tesla, the great genius. All right, continuing on. A genius needs time to study and to do experiments. So they really, that's a nice thing about being homeschooled. There's time to do whatever you want in the afternoon, let's say. They need time to do all that stuff. Time to read whatever books they think they need. Time to do experiments. Time to have conversations with mentors and role models that you can learn from. So you can't become a genius if you're spending the whole day working in a, on a farm or in a factory or wasting time in a public school, watching TV or hanging around with same age goof off kids in your class or on a cell phone all day. You need time to be alone and to think and to study and to fill in all the gaps in your knowledge. There's going to be a whole bunch of pieces of information you have to put together before you could figure something out. Um, you know, for example, when I came up with my theory of neurovascular uncoupling, I had to read stacks and stacks of books about everything about atherosclerosis, everything about diabetes, everything about hypertension, everything about excitotoxins, all the other theories of neurodegeneration. It took years of just being obsessed with that question, you know, and so also I think that's why it's helpful for a genius to be a little lonely because, you know, if you've got, you know, I remember when I was in high school and I loved my girlfriend and I couldn't wait to see her every day and I didn't care too much about studying. I wanted to see her, okay? And then when I was alone for many years in Stanford and other places, there was nothing else to do but just read and study all the time if I wasn't working in a hospital. So having time to just work on your project is necessary, okay? Um, it really helps if you got supportive parents. A lot of geniuses will tell you that their, their parents really help to guide them. You know, for John Ruskin, his mother made him read the Bible every day and he became incredibly literate and a great writer and speaker. Um, you know, Feynman, Richard Feynman, his father would teach him and help him think through complex problems and that really enriched his mind, okay? Um, geniuses will increase in a society that appreciates them. We talked about that, like ancient Athens was very open to new ideas. Renaissance Italy was a place where there was money and there's also competition. Competitions are good. They motivate the genius to perform their best. So in Italy, you know, if you can make the best uh, fresco painting on the ceiling of a church or the wall of a church, you can make a lot of money and you can show off and become famous. All right, and that'll help you to attract women, okay? So guys care about that. All right, geniuses hate loud noise. Arthur Schopenhauer and Goethe have written about that quite a bit because you can't think when there's loud noise. That's why they hate beat music, okay? Anything that's going bump, 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 it just pushes the thought out of your head. You have to work with the thought and be in contemplation. Typically, you study like a maniac. That's the preparation phase. Then you become distracted. You take a little bit of time off, and then the intuitive mind through the unconscious a lot of times comes up with the eureka moment, uh, the Archimedes eureka moment where you solve the problem. Another thing is a lot of boys, they end up getting uh, brain damage from playing sports with a lot of head trauma. You know, boxing is a terrible sport, causes head trauma. This MMA is, you know, it's a very dangerous thing if they're, if they're punching. You get punched in the head, that causes brain damage. So somebody who's doing that repeatedly at practice on a daily basis, they're lowering their IQ. Stupid. Okay, soccer. You know, you can do one of these sports 
I liked wrestling because there was no punching in the face. You don't get head trauma, all right? And there's other sports, and you can do these sports where you don't get head trauma. But if you're doing something where you're punching in the face, getting punched in the head, that's going to lower your IQ. Soccer, hitting the ball with your head, that's incredibly stupid. Why would you stick your head in the way of somebody kicking the ball? And some of those guys, man, they can really kick the ball hard. I think soccer is the stupidest thing in the world where some coach is sitting there in the corner doing corner kicks and all these poor little kids are hitting the ball with their head. That's a fast path to brain damage, okay? Uh, football potentially is dangerous. And a lot of big, strong guys hit in heads, uh, depending on what position the person plays. Lacrosse can be dangerous. Hockey, a lot of hockey players have seen get head trauma. Okay, and there's other occupations where there was high risk for head trauma. And my advice would be avoid those things. You need your brain your whole life. Life's a marathon. It's not a sprint. You want to keep your brain. Because a lot of young guys think they're cool, they're tough. Yeah, I do kickboxing or some other stuff. No, you're a dumbass if you're volunteering to get head trauma, okay? All right, um, you likely need a minimum IQ of 120. Actually, geniuses often have a significantly higher IQ than that. But IQ is much less important than people think. A lot of IQ, what we talk about IQ, is just ability to memorize and take a standardized test when you're young. So if you develop study skills, you can memorize a lot more material and you can memorize it a lot faster. That increases your effective IQ. But again, you know, like... Elon Musk had said, if he's working 10 hours a day and somebody else is only working eight hours a day, he's going to get to the problem a lot faster, even if, and he's working six days a week, they're working five days a week, even if they're both doing the same thing with their work. And so what I'm trying to say is this personality, this obsession, desire to learn, to be creative, to excel, all of those things dramatically increase a person's ability to become great at something. So that intensity of focus, incrementalism, learning everything about it, having a wide variety of interests, so you accumulate information from several different fields all connected to each other, and eventually you can see the connections and, and find new connections, transform the field. Um, it really helps if you've got time and the interest daily reading. Just listen to an audiobook in the car, read in the bathroom, intelligent conversations, having someone smart to talk to, having a mentor who can guide you or a parent. Uh, being open to this idea and exercising also maintains the brain. It increases BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic growth factor, increases uh, glycogen storage in the brain, like in the astrocytes adjacent to the neurons, um, and it causes new my mitochondria to be formed, mitochondrial biogenesis. So anyways, this book, uh, Genius by Isink, covered most of the things here. I added a, 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 about a third or more of the material here just because I've studied genius quite a bit from multiple other books. Dean Simonton wrote uh, some good stuff about it. Uh, but anyways, this was a good book. I would say this book especially emphasizes the psychologist's point of view. So we went into a ton of stuff about personality testing, IQ testing, uh, psych psychology testing, you know, far more of that I think than what most people would want. But I still enjoyed the book. Um, and so if you're interested in the subject, it, it's worth adding to the list. It wouldn't be the first thing to read on the list. If you've got like a, a younger student who you're helping, I would say the first book to give them would be Super Memory, Super Student by Harry Lorraine. That would be the thing to start with. And then we can talk about what to do next afterwards, but that would be the thing to start with. After they're done with that, they, they should probably read my book, Straight A at Stanford and on to Harvard, and they'll get a sense, or How to Raise IQ and Become a Genius. They'll get a sense of how do you push it to the max. And the reason I became interested in that was I was just an average student in high school, and all of a sudden I'm at Stanford, where the average you know, kid in the pre-med class is like 99.5 you know, or more percentile. So I had to really, really improve fast. So anyways, hope that was interesting.